The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. From time to time in their 30s and early 40s, most men and women ask themselves... What will I be doing when I'm 65 years old? What are my chances of being 100% self-supporting when it's time to stop work? Well, that's largely up to you and the decision you make right now. One such opportunity for an important decision will be offered to you in our middle commercial. It tells about the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. This plan means exactly what it says. Financial independence for you in your 60s. Do you like that idea? Then please listen carefully to this important message from the Equitable Society coming in about 14 minutes. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Marriage Swindle. Its title, The Runaway Corpse. In very ancient days, the fate of every woman was the same. She did the hard labor for the family, and her status was little more than that of a slave. In certain of the older civilizations, it was unknown for a woman to sit and eat at the same table as the male members of the group. Those taboos and other similar customs have, of course, been discarded. Today, women have attained the highest ranks in science, art, literature, and business. Every year, more and more members of the female sex find themselves in responsible positions once held exclusively by men. No field of endeavor has remained closed to the women of America, and that statement unfortunately includes the field called crime. Tonight's FBI file opens in the downtown district of a large eastern city. It is early afternoon as two middle-aged women enter an undertaker's parlor. They speak to the owner for a moment and are shown toward the rear. Our complete line of caskets is in this back room. There now, sister. Be brave. This way, please. Perhaps you'd be interested in our perfect tribute service. What's that? You select the casket. We do the rest. Ethel, I believe that would be better. You needn't decide immediately, Mrs. Carson. Thank you. Not at all. We try to live up to our motto, kind and personal consideration where the tribute never becomes a burden. Isn't that sweet? The price tag on each casket covers the entire service. This is a very good value. The wood is the finest walnut. And as you see, the lining is crushed crepe. Beautiful. Oh, Agnes, let's pick one and leave. All right. She's under such a strain. Of course. We'll take this. I'm sure you won't be sorry. When can you send the hearse? Did the deceased pass away at a hospital? At home. We can call and prepare him for the reposing room at any time. This evening? Certainly. I have your address. I'll be there with the casket coach at, uh, let us say, eight. Fine. You may use the side exit if you like. Thank you for thinking of us. We'll see you later. Very well. Go ahead, dear. Thank you. Well, that's that. I hope it works. Oh, it's bound to, Agnes. After all, what difference does it make to them if the body they come for is dead or alive? Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, police detective Tommy Stewart approaches the desk of Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. Oh, hi, Tommy. Hey, you've been a stranger lately. I won't be from now on. Why, what's up? Wedding bells is out. What? Wedding bells. Herb Carson, he escaped yesterday from the state prison. Oh, 
Tommy, I'm afraid I don't know him. Oh, I guess you hadn't been transferred here this time last year. No. We arrested him for working the marriage swindle. He was quite a boy. Huh? When we circulated marriage bureau clerks around the country with his picture, we uncovered 24 brides and quite a few places haven't been heard from yet. Is uh, this his record here? Mm-hmm. According to this, the uh, bureau had a detainer on him, huh? Yeah, he crossed more state lines than the super chief. How'd you catch him? The last woman he married died shortly after the wedding. Natural causes? Yeah, we double-checked. In her will, she left all her money to charity, around $20,000 in cash. And when it couldn't be found and her new husband couldn't be either, we put out an alarm. Did you know then it was Carson? No. Your lab gave us an ID and office prints. Oh, I see. I'm having four of his local wives brought to my office now. Want to question him with me? Well, I have some work to clean up here, Tommy. I'll be in touch with you when I finish. <laughs> Why did I do it, Ethel? Why? Do that. Spend half the day getting an undertaker to come to the house so your dear husband can steal a hearse. But Herb needs the hearse to go to the cemetery and get that money from Mrs. Watkins' vault. And when he gets the money, he skips out on you again. Agnes, Herb's my husband. Fine husband. You've been married 15 years and seen him 15 mm. minutes. It's not his fault he has to be away so much. Can't blame a man for being interested in his business. Getting married is his business? Of course. What are his hobbies? You just don't understand her. I don't understand you either. Oh, Agnes, before we see her, please promise me one thing. What? Even if you don't understand him, try to get along with him. That's a large demand, but I'll try. Herb? Be right there, dear. How did you make out? The man said he'd be here with the hearse at 8 o'clock. Oh, that's fine. What have you done to your hair? Just grade it up a little. Looks more like it's been breaded. Thank you. Ethel, I've been thinking. It's been a long time since we had a vacation together. I know. Well, to show my appreciation for this, I'm taking you on a boat trip. Oh, Herb, that'll be wonderful. Wouldn't it be better to give her the cash? She won't need any. She'll be with me. For five minutes. Agnes, what a thing to say. What about three years ago when he took every dime you had, said he was going to a movie and didn't show up again till the following summer? I explained that to Ethel. I did go to the movie and I ran into a prospect. We were married and, well, one marriage just led to another. You see, Agnes? Yeah. Ethel, dear... If that undertaker's coming at eight, we'd better get inside and start packing. Detective Stewart. Tommy, this is Jim Taylor. Well, where are you, Jim? I'm still tied up at the office. I need help. Oh. You hear that babble? Those are Carson's ex-wives. Have you talked to them yet? No. Well, let me know if you get anything from them. You're not going to let me face them alone, are you? Well, I'm still working, Tommy, but I'll get down there as soon as I can. Well, all right. But if anything happens to me, remember, it was all in the line of duty. Okay. So long. Bye. Why? All right, ladies. Oh, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. All right, ladies. Hold it. Hold it. Who are you? I'm Detective Stewart. Where's my husband? We're looking for him, too. That's why you were called in here. You've got to find him for me. Find him for you? Look, honey, I'm married to him, too. Girls, for your information, I'm the only one he ever loved. He's a bum. Oh, oh he oh, is no. not. You Dare you say that? that? Oh, all right, ladies, all right. I'd like to I will get not your relationship like straightened out I here. Have. Now, when did you marry him, ma'am? Five years ago, and I can prove I was his only wife. Why, I've got his prized possession, his uniform as an army colonel. For your information, dear, he was an admiral in the Navy. Oh, you're both lying. He hated war. He only went into the Marines to get it over with in a hurry. He's a bum. Oh, well, yes. The idea is such a... Ladies, ladies, please, let's all be quiet. Let's all be calm. Now, we'll start from the beginning. How long ago did you say... Oh, 
What time did that undertaker say he'd be here? About eight. He's due now. Where is your dear sister? Oh, she went out. She said she'd stay out until we left here. Yes, well, perhaps that's just as well. The undertaker? Now, see. Oh, hello, Mr. Martin. Good evening, madam. You the uh, undertaker? The funeral director. My assistant will be up with the cot in a moment. Where's the hearse? The casket coach is right outside. May I see the departed, please? This way. Through that door. Thank you. Hey, let me out. Let me out. Just a moment. He doesn't seem very happy about the closet. Well, it's hard to please some people. He said his assistant was coming out. I know. What will you do about him? That's easy, my dear. We'll just give him the other closet. Hello, Tommy. Oh, Jim, am I glad to see you. I, uh, I gather the women are still here, huh? And still talking. You look a little weary. I feel like Clyde Beatty. <laughs> Tell me, did you get anything from them? One possible lead. What's that? Well, the other women agreed that Carson had one wife that he always went back to. Oh? Huh? She apparently was the first woman he ever married. I sent out a tracer on her and found that she lived here in town. We got her address, but she's moved. Any forwarding address? No, but one of her neighbors said that she went to live with her sister. Her sister's name is Jones. That's all we know. How long ago did she move? About nine months ago. While Carson was still in jail? Right? Yeah. Well, then you're assuming that he'll follow his pattern and go back to her, huh? That could be. Everything against him. Oh, Mr. Stewart, I, I refuse to stay in there with those women any that longer. Goes that goes for me. Tommy, you, you better handle it. Oh, wait, Jim. I'm going right to call the place that might have the first Mrs. Thing. Carson's no, no, address. No, Ethel, watch on your side. Look for a vault with the name Watkins on it. It's right along this street. Was that your last wife's name? Yes. I don't see how you remember one from the other. When you've hidden $20,000 in someone's vault, it's rather easy. I hope Agnes isn't too angry. About what? Those men in her closet. She didn't know we were going to leave them there. Well, what else could we do? Oh, look. I think that one there says Watkins. Where? See? Oh, oh yes. Yes, that's it. I'll wait here. No, dear. I'd rather you came in with me. But I... Don't... I'll need you to hold the flashlight. Oh, all right. Here's the light. But don't use it till we get inside. Where is the money? In a vase, in a niche in the wall. Oh, no. I have a key someplace. Here it is. Now, turn on the flashlight. Very well. Come right in, dear. Just follow me. Now, just shine the light on that wall on the left. That's it. There's our vase. Herb, I'm not sure that I like this very much. It won't take long, dear. Now, if the little bag is still in this vase, and it is, well, there's the money. Mission accomplished, my Herb, dear. Herb, let's get out of here. Oh, I almost forgot. You wait here just one minute. I brought some flowers along. I left them in the hearse. I'll go get them. Oh, Herb, I don't Just want stay them. right here, my dear. I'll be right back. Where are you going, Herb? Uh, Agnes, what in the world are you doing here? I rode with you in the back. How did you ever I get... I figured you'd pull something like this. Like, like what? Running out on Ethel. Now turn around and go back in there. Just a minute. Herb, I've got a gun. Get moving. Agnes, this is entirely uncalled for. Unlock that vault. Go on. <laughs> Ethel? 
Agnes, what are you doing here? Saving you from an all-night stay in the vault. I'll take that money, Herb. But Ethel, will you please reason Agnes, with your sister? What's going on? Your dear husband here was planning to skip out and leave you. I, 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 I planned nothing of the sort. Where's the money? I didn't find it. But, Herb, you got it out of this vase. No, that's not true, Ethel. It, it, it's still in there. Let's see the vase. Here. It's empty. I don't understand it. Maybe you will understand this. <coughs> now, let's search him for the money and we'll take that little vacation. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official file of your FBI. But now, listen. Okay, Cora, I'll answer the door. That's the mailman with our check from the Equitable Society. Every month, right on the dot, those Equitable checks come to members who have paid up their Equitable Independent 60s plans. They're checks that mean financial independence for life after you're 65 years old. And here's Mr. Arnold Muller who started one of these plans back in 1928. You made your last payment in 1950, didn't you, Mr. Muller? May 1st, 1950, I quit work, Mr. Keating. I've been having the time of my life ever since. In other words, Mr. Muller, you're now enjoying the three freedoms that go with an independent 60s plan. First, freedom from money worries and job worries. Financial independence. Mr. Keating, I haven't given money a thought since I retired. No need to with those equitable checks coming in the way they do. Second... With an equitable independent 60s plan, you're free to live anywhere you please. We've bought a little five-acre farm on the edge of one of the prettiest towns in America. Third, freedom to do the things you've always wanted to do. I've got one of the swellest gardens you ever saw, Mr. Keating. We deep freeze all kinds of fruits and vegetables, and it cuts our food bills way down. I tell you, that was the luckiest day in my life when I found out that you don't have to be rich to afford the equitable independent 60s plan. That's a fact. You don't have to earn big money to begin an equitable independent 60s plan. Ask your equitable representative to explain why you probably have a big head start toward independent 60s because of your social security and the life insurance you already own. Often, only a small amount of additional insurance is all that's required. A few dollars a week did it for me. Friends, why not profit by Mr. Muller's experience? Phone your equitable society representative without delay. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Corp. As you listen to tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you may well have said to yourself, only people of below average intelligence could fall for such an obvious confidence game. Unfortunately, such is not the case. Throughout the country, there are millions of men and women who are lonesome. Concerning these people, one writer says, quote, every day the postmen of the United States deliver a million letters to men and women who have advertised for husbands and wives. Men and women who belong to the vast and tragic army of the unwanted. At the offices of the 400 matrimonial correspondence and lonely heart clubs, they are numbered in the hundreds of thousands, in millions. Every year they contribute to the pocketbooks of club owners several millions of dollars. These people are not necessarily unintelligent. They are just lonely. And their natural human desire for companionship often makes them easy victims for unscrupulous swindlers. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters. FBI Special Agent Taylor has just entered the office of Detective Tommy Stewart. Tommy, we just missed Carson. Where? At his sister-in-law's home. When I left here, I called state prison and had them check their mail file. Yeah? They found Carson had written to his first wife, care of a Miss Agnes Jones, 38 Adams Avenue. And you just missed him there? Yes, he left with his wife a couple of hours ago in a hearse. A hearse? Yes, they tricked an undertaker into coming to the sister's house, locked him and his helper into closets, and stole the hearse. We better get out an alarm. I already have, Tommy. Why would he want a hearse? He could have had a rental agency deliver a car. Yeah, I know. 
Well, he shouldn't get very far in it. Well, you must know that, too. Now, uh, tell me, what was the name of that wife of his that died? Mrs. Watkins. Now, didn't you tell me that Carson was suspected of stealing the cash from her estate? That's right. Well, isn't it just possible that he buried that money with her, left it there till he was ready to pick it up? Yeah. Tommy, let's find out what cemetery she was buried in and get out there. Ethel, will you stop crying? Never is very cruel of you. What was? Leaving her about there that way. Cruel? Don't you know what he was trying to do to you? If it's anything bad, I'd rather not hear it. Well, you're going to. One of the neighbors told me darling Herb was out all morning. But he said he was staying in. That's what made me suspicious. I knew he'd go out for only one reason. To get married. Agnes. Let me finish. I called that florist he always uses to send roses to his brides. They had an order from him. I knew how he worked, so I called the marriage bureau. Sure enough, somebody named Watkins had gotten a license. I came back to the house to tell you, but you were leaving. That's why I climbed into the hearse. I still can't believe it. How much proof do you need? Didn't he try to lock you in the vault? Didn't he lie about not having the money? Well... Ethel, if that isn't enough, you saw what he had in his pocket. One boat ticket. You think that was for you or for him? Now let's find a place to leave this hearse. Tommy, I just spoke to the gateman. He saw the hearse pull in here tonight. A gray-haired man was driving it. A woman was with him. How long ago? Almost three hours. Did he see it leave? Yes, and there were two women in the front seat going out. A man was missing. Later, the gateman said he saw the man stagger out the front entrance. On foot? Yeah. Well, come on, let's go in the vault, huh? Right. Yeah, what do you know? They left the gate wide open. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tommy, look. They're on the floor. Pieces of a broken vase. Doesn't that appear to be a fresh blood stain? Huh? Yeah. Well, that accounts for what happened to Carson. Must have been knocked out with this vase, then rolled, because look here on the floor. Change, key ring. And what's this? What do you got, Tom? Envelope from a travel agency. But it's empty. Well, those two women could have gotten the ticket. Ticket to where? Well, that's what we've got to find out. Agency won't be open this time of night. Yeah. Well, let's finish up here. And if nothing has come in on Carson or the hearse, we'll check the travel agency first thing in the morning. Well, I checked the travel agency, Jim. I showed them the envelope. They didn't remember anyone answering to Carson's description. No, I was afraid they wouldn't. This agency specializes in ocean travel. Oh? I'm having the passenger list checked on all boats sailing today. Well, probably be using an assumed name. Oh, and the hearse has been located. Oh, where? On McKinley Street. McKinley, that's down to the docks, isn't it? Yeah, our men went over it. No leads. Jim, how about giving each steamship company a description of Carson? I'm afraid that wouldn't pay off either, Tommy. Our files show Carson as having dark brown hair, but evidence at the cemetery showed that it's now gray. And I've just been going over these photostats of his marriage licenses. There's a different description on every one of them. Yeah, that's bad. Tommy, I've been trying to get some form, some pattern out of these. I was just about to arrange them in sequence when you came in. Let's see, here's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two. Uh, here's number three. Yeah, thanks. Uh, number four. Hey, wait a minute. Tommy, there is a pattern here. Let's look through the stack and find his last license. <laughs> One twenty-one. One twenty-three. Here's our cabin. Good. I couldn't walk another step. Come on. We'll leave our coats here and then go up uh, on just deck. Just a minute. You must be in the wrong cabin. Why, isn't this one twenty-three? Yes. Well, here's our ticket. But but my ticket has the same number on it, too, and I'm sharing the cabin with my husband. Lady, is your husband a tall, gray-haired man with glasses? Yes. I'm sorry to tell you, but he's her husband, too. What? 
Yes. And he's also married to Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Bentley, Mrs. Randall, I Mrs. Don't Clifford, believe Mrs. You. Hall. His real name is Herb Carson, and he's a cheap, four-flushing, double-crossing... Agnes, crossing. don't talk about Herb that way. For your information, my husband's a bachelor, and he's always been one. Now, please, get out of here. Herb, darling. Herb, dear. Well, lady... Sorry, wrong cabin. Uh, Herb, it's me, Marie. Yes, and it's her, Ethel, and me, Agnes. Herb, who are they? Answer me, Herb. Two extremely jealous women. But are you married to that one? Well, I... I used to be. But you said you were a bachelor. When he was nine. I've heard enough from you. Your attitude compels me to tell the whole truth. These women have hounded me, Marie, and when they heard I'd married you, they vowed they'd do everything in the world to break it up. Herb. And last night, when I refused to give in to them, they waylaid me and stole my money. I came here to get that money back. That's a good story, but we are keeping the money. Oh, no, you're not. You're forgetting the gun, Herb. Agnes! Here he is, Tommy. Well, if you're from the steamship company, put those women out of here. I'm from the FBI, and they're all under arrest. <laughs> Herbert Carson was sentenced in federal court to 10 years for interstate transportation of stolen property violations, and Agnes Jones and Ethel Carson were sentenced in federal court to six months for harboring a federal fugitive. Special Agent Taylor and Detective Stewart were able to arrive at the boat because of the pattern in the marriage licenses. Agent Taylor noticed that Carson always used the maiden name of each wife for the marriage which followed. It was assumed he would continue the pattern in making his reservations, a fact which was borne out when Agent Taylor called the steamship line. And so your FBI was able to close another file because of the aid and cooperation of the local police. Without such cooperation, many cases would be almost impossible to solve. That is why your FBI continues to ask you, the people, to exert your every effort to obtain an adequate local law enforcement staff. For law enforcement, like charity, must begin at home. Now one final question on the cost of the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. I already have a good bit of life insurance. I don't think I could add the cost of an Independent 60s plan on top of what I'm now paying. You don't have to. Your Equitable Society representative will show you how to integrate your present life insurance into an independent 60s plan. Often, because of life insurance already owned and Social Security, only a comparatively small additional amount of insurance is all that's required. Your equitable man will be glad to give you the exact figure or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, murder. Its title, The Tribal Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Parley Bear, Betty Blythe, Mildred Byron, Florence Lake, Jeanette Nolan, Ted Osborne, Peggy Weber, and Carlton Young. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Tribal Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for A Life in Your Hands, starring Lee Bowman, when it comes your way next over most of these same stations. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>